need some more people to make their way in. Good morning and welcome to Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church. It is good to be together today. Uh, the heat is indeed on. It's just taking it a little longer to get to the temperature it's set for than we had anticipated. There's always that joy in the first time you turn the heat on for the winter season. So um, here we are. It is working, just working a little more slowly than we remembered it did. I did want to uh, share with you that Village Congregational Church had planned to hold their harvest fair yesterday out on the common as they always do, but with the rain they canceled and it is happening this afternoon from noon to 4 p.m. and they've just asked us to help spread the word because folks work so hard on that event and they want to make sure everyone got the word that it is indeed happening this afternoon. So you can have like a pre-lunch at uh, coffee hour and then head over to the fair. Tom. Hi everyone. So this is another announcement for this year's opportunity to walk alongside those poor, hungry, thirsty, and displaced brothers and sisters in our world by walking and donating to this year's crop walk uh, to benefit the church world service and our local food pantries. This year's walk is fast approaching. We'll be walking from the Village Congregational Church on Saturday, October 21st. Registration is at 8.30 a.m. and the walk itself is at 9. It's a fabulous cause, so please join me in giving generously to this year's campaign. Our church has a goal to collect $2,000 this year for the CWS, uh, but we can't do it without the help of this generous congregation. Thank you for those who have already donated enough for us to reach 20% of our goal. So here's hoping we can meet the rest of our goal together. Thank you. Okay. Any other announcements to share with one another? All right. Well, today is World Communion Sunday, which is a day of global celebration of the sacred ritual that helps us remember Jesus' life and ministry, connects us with our Christian ancestors and siblings across time and space. There is great joy to be found at this table, joy in the vibrant relationships that nurture and sustain this community, joy in the sharing of our gifts and resources, joy in the journey as we work toward a more just and equitable world. So let us enter into worship together, beginning with our call to worship. We hear God's calling to have joyful spirits as Christ's followers. We lift our hearts to be filled with 
We know that sometimes it is difficult to be joyful in life. We open ourselves to the joy that comes with justice. Today we celebrate our communion table with people all over the world. Through Jesus we are brought together and no matter how we get there, believing in the host of this table who makes our joy complete, let us share our stories, our compassion, our sympathy as part of one human family that shares the love of Christ and the breaking of the bread. Hear now the scripture from the second chapter of the letter of Philippians that was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison, followed by a remembrance of what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. Imagine those early Christian Philippians gathered at a table, reading these words to one another and remembering the words of Jesus Christ. Start with Philippians 2. 1 through 13, imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in, uh, very, in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And next I'll be reading uh, from Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32, the authority of Jesus questioned. Jesus entered the temple courts And while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The parable of the two sons. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes Prostitutes, and I'm missing a page. (laughs) (laughs) The word of God for the people of God. (laughs) Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to Learning Together. So today, today I have with me here some grape juice and some bread. So it's nothing really special to look at, right? They're just groceries. But on the first Sunday in October, United Methodist congregations and Christian churches all around the world join in celebrating World Communion Sunday. Today, is World Communion Sunday. So does anybody know what the word communion means? It actually, you know, it actually means that communion is a special meal that we serve in our community. And don't those two words sound alike? Communion and community. Our tradition of eating bread and grape juice was started almost 2,000 years ago in a city called Jerusalem, far away from here. A man named Jesus had a community of friends like ours who listened to Jesus' teachings and believed that he was a good example of how everyone should be in community. Jesus taught that we should welcome everyone to God's table, even people we don't get along with. Jesus showed love, peace, and grace to everyone. These are the things we talk about each week as we gather together in worship. Whenever we serve this special meal, communion, we're reminding ourselves and one another that we have a place to belong, that everyone is welcome at God's table. I always wait to hear that, that all are welcome at God's table. 
World Communion Sunday began as a worldwide Communion Sunday at the Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1933. The Reverend Hugh Thompson Kerr and his congregation sought to demonstrate the interconnectedness of Christian churches regardless of denomination. Reverend Kerr appropriately chose the sacrament of Holy Communion to symbolize this unity. In 1940, the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America, which included all the denominations of the United Methodist Church, adopted Worldwide Communion Sunday. The celebration occurs on the first Sunday in October. So in connection with the celebration of Worldwide Communion Sunday, the Methodist, the Methodist Church collected a special offering for the Fellowship of Suffering and Service. The Methodist Commission on Overseas Relief, which is now called the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and that's UMCOR as we know it, received half the offering. The other half was divided between two agencies that ministered to military members, the Methodist Commission on Chaplains and the Methodist Commission on Camp Activity. Today, the United Methodist Church celebrates World Communion Sunday with congregations all over the globe. Followers of Jesus Christ in large churches and small, on farms and in cities, in ornate buildings and under tents, gather to receive the bread and cup of Holy Communion. This grape juice and bread are groceries, but when served together here in community with each other, we are reminded how special each one of us is to be seated at God's table. And today being World Community Sunday, communion is a very special uh, experience for us knowing that Christians around the world are celebrating together. Please join me in this echo prayer. We come to the table, come to, the table. to share in God's feast. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome. We, gather we gather in peace. This is God's table. This is God's table. It's, not it's not yours or mine. God's love is for everyone. God's love is for, everyone. For, now for now and all time. Amen. The Sunday school is heading out. For those who haven't caught up with how things are working this year, we're doing Sunday school pretty much the first and third Sunday of each month. Um, and the kids are all working together across age groups. And we're grateful for those who have stepped forward to lead this. And that also means we get to have the kids in worship with us twice a month, which is also a wonderful gift. So please join me in a spirit of prayer. God, as we gather here to hear your word, to celebrate your presence in our lives, and to prepare our hearts to come to your table, we ask that the thoughts of our minds and our hearts might be your thoughts, that my words might reflect your words and what it is you would have us hear this day. So be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. In case you didn't hear it the last 10 times, we've said it. Every year on the first Sunday of October, United Methodist congregations join Christian churches across the globe to celebrate World Communion Sunday. And as Ingrid said, this uh, Celebration began under the name of Worldwide Communion Sunday at Shady Side Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1933. I invite you to think a little bit too about what was happening in the world in 1933, right? What is your history? 
And also, as Ingrid said, Reverend Kerr and his congregation saw communion as a way to demonstrate the interconnectedness of our Christian churches, regardless of our denomination. Explaining specifically why he chose the sacrament of Holy Communion, Kerr said, the term Holy Communion invites us to focus on the holiness of our communion with God and one another. So if you think about it, when we gather at Christ's table, we don't gather as Methodists or as Congregationalists or as Episcopalians. We are all simply children of God. And so for one Sunday, instead of arguing about our differences, we focus on what we share, God's amazing grace and love, and our common mission of sharing that love with the world. And Paul's letter to the Philippians is a helpful companion as we reflect on unity today. You see, this letter was written to an emerging Christian community in eastern Macedonia that Paul dearly loved. Now, pastors aren't supposed to have a favorite church any more than parents are supposed to have a favorite child. But anyone who reads Paul's letters is struck by the affection he expresses to the church at Philippi. And when you love a church, which means loving the people of the church, you want them to grow in love and service to one another in the community. And just like everyone needs to row in the same direction for a boat to reach its destination, everyone in a congregation has to work toward a shared mission and vision for the church to head in the right direction. Paul names the unifying mission of the church as living and proclaiming the gospel expressed by caring for one another and mutual indebtedness to one another. There's a translation of scripture called the First Nations Version. The publisher describes it as a dynamic equivalence translation that captures the simplicity, clarity, and beauty of the native storytellers in English while remaining faithful to the original language of the New Testament. I came across it this week when reading notes on this passage, and so I invite you to hear how it expresses the opening verses of the passage, verses 1 and 2. As you walk the road with the chosen one, have you gained from him courage for the journey? Have you found comfort in his love? Do you share together in his spirit? Has his tenderness and mercy captured your heart? If so, then have the same kind of thoughts. Love with one heart. Join together in one spirit and walk side by side on one path. This will make my heart leap for joy. In her commentary on this passage in the Christian century, Liz Coolidge Jenkins writes that the First Nations version imagines Paul encouraging the Philippian believers not to conform to one particular way of seeing the world, but to walk side by side to journey together, to have the same kinds of thoughts, perhaps, as Christ has, thoughts of courage, comfort, sharing, thoughts of tenderness and mercy, thoughts of love, connection, and joy. Not the exact same beliefs about everything, but an unshakable sense of shared life together along the way. And I can't think of a better description for church, and for this church in particular. We're able to walk alongside one another, even when we have different understandings. Centuries before Brene Brown researched the idea of belonging, Paul spoke to our deep need for connection. Because people deeply desire to be part of something, to experience real connection with others while maintaining their own authenticity, freedom, and personal power. So we can acknowledge our many differences and still think of one another with care 
and base our interactions on a deep sense of our interconnectedness. Jenkins proposes the ideal church is one where we are safe to reveal ourselves, secure enough to humble ourselves, free to offer our humility, inspired to consider others' needs and not just our own. We are invited to pursue a kind of unity that does not require us to conform, but draws out our uniqueness. We are grounded in Christ's love and fellowship, rooted in Christ's example of how we might live. For Paul, such unity is related to action. It's in the day-to-day living out of our beliefs that we show what it is we believe. In writing to the Philippians, he encourages them to embrace humility. And he knows that this is a difficult thing to do, more difficult for some than others. In fact, it can only be accomplished with the help of Jesus Christ himself, who chose humility even though he is God. That's what that he chose refers to. Paul offers a beautiful description of Jesus who is, of who Jesus is, and invites us to live as Jesus lives. In meeting Jesus again for the first time, Marcus Borg notes that in Jesus, rather than emphasizing right belief, God becomes an experiential reality. God can be known in a direct and intimate way, not merely believed in. On our drive home from the retreat house yesterday, Joan Osborne's What If God Were One of Us came on the radio, and you can thank me later for putting that earworm in your head. I used to hate that song. I was always yelling at the radio. I have this habit of yelling at the radio, especially if I'm driving alone. I always say, he is one of us. Don't you know about Jesus? It's taken some time, but now that I hear it as the artist intended, I hear it as an invitation to think about God, not as some abstract far off being, but as near as our next breath present in each one of us. And that's what Paul is saying in this letter. It's not about believing in Jesus. It's about Jesus being our companion, our example of how to live. After all, Jesus lived our life and died our death. There's nothing that abstract about that. Paul says the very name of Jesus should stir something deep and profound in us, touching us in the places of our deepest longing and sincerest hopes. So today, with Christians around the world, we gather at Christ's table. We confess our sins, forgiving one another for our actions and inactions, sharing responsibility for the brokenness of the world, and recommitting ourselves to bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We remember the night that Jesus gathered with friends in an upper room, just as we gather with friends in this sanctuary. We hear the story again, the story of creation, the story of God's people, the story of trying and failing and trying again, the story of Jesus his life, his love, his grace, his persecution, his execution, his death, his resurrection, his promise to be with us always. This is what we remember when we come to this table and receive bread and juice. And all around the world today, since the sun first rose and it makes its way around the world, others are doing the same. Together, learning from those differences and doing our best to become more like Jesus every day. Amen.
may be seated as we turn our hearts to prayer. Most holy God, we gather this morning sighing a collective sigh of relief, grateful for crises that have been averted, even as we wonder how they became crises in the first place. Help us to be more like Jesus, to truly love one another, not just when we agree, but always. We gather at your table with the world, with those who've come before us and with those who will come after us. And we pause to pray, asking that you be with all those who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit that we now lift their names. Comfort them, offer them peace. Give them the healing that they need, which may not be the healing we think they need. And teach us how to comfort and how to offer peace and how to heal. We pray for our world that we might work together to heal division, that we might work together to restore your creation, that we might work together to care for one another, even or perhaps especially because we disagree. Help us to be the church that you call us to be, your presence in this time and place. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So most weeks, I remind you of the ways that your gifts to this church make a difference, how they translate into transforming people's lives through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, I'm going to invite you instead to pause for a moment and to think about why it is that you give. What is it about this church, about our ministry and our mission that you want to be a part of? I'll give you a minute to think about that before we collect the offering. As you place your offering in the collection plate this morning, I know that you give it as a gift of thanks for what you have received for God. So perhaps you just want to say thank you as you place it in the basket.
and let us pray together. Holy God of infinite patience and grace, we bring our offerings today, knowing that our actions too often don't live up to our intentions and aspirations. When calling ourselves Christians, we announce ourselves as followers of Christ, knowing how many times our choices have made us unrecognizable as his disciples. Yet you wait patiently for us to find our way back to the path. May our giving this day and our living reflect our desire to <laughs> All right. Let's start from May. May our giving this day and our lot living reflect our desire to be on the path that would be recognized as faithful to the Savior, in whose blessed name we pray. Amen. So a word before we share in this holy feast. I am sure that you, like me, uh, know many people who are um, not feeling well these days and that there has been an uptick in COVID. The good news is we have learned so much about this and we know how to protect ourselves and how to protect one another. At this time, there's not calling for any drastic actions, just simple things, remembering to wash our hands. and. Just to be extra safe, I am the daughter of an OR nurse who used to have this thing about flu season, you couldn't touch anyone. She would stand up in church and say, during the passing of the peace, we should bump elbows. So this comes by me quite naturally. We're gonna do the prepackaged communion throughout the winter months, just to, as an extra step to care for one another. And I'll remind you that we have these handy little ones that are double-sided. So when you get it, you're gonna to wanna to tip it this way, the skinnier end up. You peel this, you will get your little piece of gluten-free bread, and then you can tip it over and peel this side to get the juice. They peel much easier than the old ones that we used to have. And I'm gonna invite us today, I know Debbie will be helping to serve communion, to come to the rail, and we'll serve from either side, and we can just take a moment and be present, because that's the other thing. For me, I miss kneeling at the rail. I grew up kneeling at the rail, but a lot of you did as well. And I think there's a way that just our posture speaks to our receiving as well. So all are invited at this table. All are invited to come and grow closer to Jesus, who offered us this way to remember and to reconnect with one another as well as with God. So let us join together in the great thanksgiving. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the Holy One, our God. God of love, in the beginning you created us in your image. Male and female, differently abled, gay, straight, and queer, you created us in your image. Black and brown, pink, brown, and yellow, you created us in your image. You made covenant to be our God and claimed us as your people. You judged the forces of oppression and led us from captivity to freedom. Therefore, with people of every tribe and language, every people and nation, we sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy one, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed are all who come in your name, and blessed is Jesus, your Christ. He spread your love to the rich and poor, sick and healthy, young and old. He created a community of saints and sinners, natives and aliens, insiders and outsiders. He offered reconciliation to all people, but was resisted by the forces of privilege and power. He was condemned by the forces of exclusion and empire. He was crucified and died. But Christ was raised by your glory and still offers life to all people. In this meal, Christ offers us your spirit, your grace, your eternal life. And so we remember on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and shared it with his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, blessed it with thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink, of this all of you this is my blood poured out for you and for many in a new covenant which is the forgiveness of sin as long as we break this bread and share this cup we remember his death and resurrection until he comes again Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so as often as we break this bread and share this cup, we remember his death and resurrection until he comes again. Remembering these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restores our life. Christ will come again in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts that they may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, one with you, one with each other, and one with all the world. May we reach out with the love of Christ to all who are excluded and bring them to their place at the table. Give us the Spirit of Christ, to confront the power of rank and privilege, to give our lives to your love and faithfulness that overcomes all injustice and oppression. All glory and honor is yours, loving God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together as Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's join together in our prayer after communion. Gracious God, we thank you for the mystery that you give yourself to us. As you have made the scattered grain into one loaf, so in your love you have made all followers of Christ around the world into one body. Send us into the world in love for the sake of the healing of all creation. In the name and spirit of Christ, amen. The table of joy requires much of us. It asks us not to rely on expecting to feel good all the time in order to do good in the world. It shows us that we can have fuller, more invigorating lives when we choose to cultivate a practice of joy by staying fully present to ourselves and to one another and by staying open to the unexpected movements of spirit. The grace of God abounds. The invitation of Christ is wide. The power of the transforming spirit will surprise us every time. So may the blessings of joy you find here go with you and move with you to others wherever you go this week. And let the people of God say,